Good morning, I'm Sana, and you're listening to Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. Every Monday morning, I'm joined by experts from across the country who are investigating our most pressing social issues and common curiosities. Over the next hour, you'll learn about their inspirations, motivations, and of course, what they know about the world around us. So grab a cup of coffee and get ready for a fun and insightful conversation. For the past year or so, there is one phrase that has dominated our news cycle, critical race theory. But despite the frequency and furor with which it is invoked, few people know what it actually means or where the concept originated. Of course, that hasn't stopped folks from rallying against it, going as far as calling for bans on critical race theory in K through 12 education, which we've seen passed into law in a number of states, including here in Tennessee, and also establishing bans on quote unquote divisive concepts at the university and college level. Governor Bill Lee signed Tennessee's own divisive concepts bill into law earlier this spring. But shouldn't we know what critical race theory is and what it is not, especially since it seems like this is a term that isn't going anywhere anytime soon? To help shed some light on this topic today, I'm joined by Dr. Victor Ray. Dr. Ray is the author of On Critical Race Theory, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care. He is the F. Wendell Miller Associate Professor in the Departments of Sociology and Criminology and African American Studies at the University of Iowa and a non-resident fellow in governance studies at the Brookings Institution. His research applies critical race theory to classical sociological questions to show how race shapes social processes typically considered race neutral, such as organizational policy. His work appears in journals such as the American Sociological Review, Sociology of Race and Ethnicity, and Sociological Theory. His work has won multiple awards, including the Early Career Award from the American Sociological Association's Section on Racial and Ethnic Minorities and the Theory Prize from the American Sociological Association's Theory Section. Dr. Ray is also an active public scholar, publishing commentary in outlets such as the Washington Post, Harvard Business Review, and Boston Review. His work has been funded by the Ford Foundation and the National Science Foundation. Well, welcome, Dr. Victor Ray. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm happy to speak with you. Yes, I am so excited. First of all, I was super excited to see you writing this book, and we'll talk a little bit more about how the book came to be in a moment, but I just have to say, and I think you know this, I am a big fan of yours and a big fan of this book. I got a chance to read it. The book is absolutely amazing, which I knew it would be because you are amazing, so the book had no choice, but I just want listeners to know that the book, I just... Straight off the bat, I want the listeners to know the book is super easy to read. Um, I think it's very, you know, conversational and it's breaking down this concept that, again, has kind of been in the public conversation for over a year at this point, but that it kind of seems like, okay, but what are we really talking about? And this book really clearly tells us, right, what critical race theory is, why it matters, and why you should care. So kudos to you for really such a, being able to distill this concept down, but also write it in a way where it's interesting, it's engaging, and then folks can actually have some knowledge about this concept and talk about it uh, with a little bit of, you know, authority. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. For our listeners, could you tell us a little bit just about the story of how this book came to be and how you came to write it? Sure. Uh, This book came to be uh, really in response to the moral panic that was happening around critical race theory in the country. Um, I have, as as I talk about in the book, I have been reading and studying critical race theory for more than 10 years since I was an undergraduate. Um, I use it in my own research, and I was actually prepping to teach a class on critical race theory when uh, Donald Trump announced his executive order banning, quote unquote, banning the concept in the federal government. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what? So in response to that, I wrote a short piece for the Washington Post just outlining sort of some of the basic ideas about what a, what critical race theory was, and I thought that this would eventually die down. Well, uh, 
it, it has not died down, right? <laughs> right. It, only, it has only spread. So a couple of months after the Washington Post piece, I uh, tweeted jokingly that I wanted to write a book about critical race theory and uh, a agent and a publisher reached out to me and uh, we, we decided to move ahead with the book. So the goals of this book are, are a couple of things. One, as you pointed out in your very generous inter introduction, I thought the public needed a clear, concise explainer on critical race theory. So there are a couple of these from critical race theorists that are older, uh, but they're directed mainly at academics. And I thought this had become a part of the general conversation and people needed to know what they were talking about with some facts behind it. Yes. Uh, so th that was sort of the main one of the goals. The other was to sort of cut through the propaganda around what people were saying about critical race theory. I think critical race theory is one very important tool for understanding and trying to intervene in the pervasive racial inequality in the United States. And the folks uh, who are propagandizing about critical race theory, uh, it was pretty clear to me they weren't interested in um, intervening with or trying to help racial inequality or fix it. They were manipulating it for political gain. And uh, I, I wanted to try and intervene in that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I mean, I think you have done such a great job at meeting both of those goals in this book. And I just love how you said, you know, I'm just on Twitter talking about how, you know, I'd love to expand on this. And, you know, I love this idea of putting like putting these ideas out there, one, you know, about critical race theory, but also this desire to create kind of like a primer, something that someone could have on their nightstand and kind of read, you know, kind of throughout the week and really understand it versus, and of course, you know, I'm familiar with some of these critical race theory um, primers that we have in the academic setting, whereas it's like, okay, I'm not trying to get a PhD. I'm just trying to understand what this word is and how it's relevant to my life. And to your credit, that's exactly what you do in this book is kind of break down what critical race theory is, how it started, but then also how we see it happening in our own lives. And so I think that's part of what makes it accessible with all of the you know contemporary examples that you give that again, are things that are impacting people right now. Um, so let's kind of jump into this a little bit more. Okay, so what is critical race theory? So I, I answer this question in two ways. So critical race theory emerged to explain the not sort of failures of the civil rights movement, but the backlash to the civil rights movement that started to occur in the late 70s and early 80s. And there was a group of law students and uh, uh, law professors, including Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw, who wanted to explain sort of how the law allowed for this backlash, right, in the face of massive civil rights victories. So they got a group of folks together and they started developing a body of, of literature. And that body of literature, that was really based in the law, that body of literature uh, was from the start interdisciplinary, drawing on history, drawing on social science to explain the intractability of racial inequality in the United States. From there, uh, it spread outward as good ideas do in the social sciences or in the natural sciences. They get adopted and adapted and it, it spread to education, it spread to sociology, it spread to other social science and humanities disciplines. That being said, uh, I still think it was pretty niche. I don't think it was in any way sort of the dominant kind of uh, teaching, for instance, when I was in graduate school, I had to seek out these texts. They weren't central to the sociological curriculum when I was getting my PhD. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think is kind of ironic about the moral panic is it has actually, in a, in a weird way, brought more attention to critical race theory than the, the field had uh, prior to this moral panic around it. So on the one hand, I wish the moral panic had never happened. Right. <laughs> On the other, I think uh, when something like this happens, those of us who are committed to 
racial justice, actually there's an opportunity to uh, correct the record and hopefully, uh, you know, make things a little better in the face of people trying to make them worse. Right, absolutely. And, you know, again, I love this point of, you know, critical race theory is not pervasive throughout higher education, right, as it is being constructed as if, you know, every class is teaching critical race theory and somehow um, professors are indoctrinating students. And it certainly isn't incorporated in through in K through 12 education. Um, so could you tell us a little bit more about what critical race theory was meant to do, or maybe even some of the components behind this broader concept called critical race theory? Sure. So I think um, critical race theory in the law, one of the things it was meant to do was to, to critique sort of both the left and the right as in, insufficient for explaining why racial inequality was so intractable. So part of the backlash to the civil rights movement was the development of something that uh, scholars call colorblind racism, right? So the idea that if we have a facially neutral law or policy, we have therefore dealt with racial inequality. Critical race theory kind of turns that on its head and says, look, you can, because racism is structural and built into things like our segregated neighborhoods or the ways we um, distribute resources for public schools through property taxes, because those are built on historical kinds of inequality, just you're not starting from zero. So if you say we are no longer going to take race into account, you are letting that system continue. So there's a quote I use in the book from a, a Nixon advisor. It was something like Nixon, uh, this was reported that Nixon said, um, the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to create a system that makes it look, that recognizes that problem while making it look like that's not the problem, right? So they were very explicit about creating uh, a system that continued to entrench racial inequality while pretending to be facially neutral. Mm. Yes. I mean, I think that's so key. What you said is that we as a society, we're not starting at zero, right? We've had decades and decades and decades of intentional explicit laws that have encoded racial inequality. And so now it's not simply a matter of having policies that don't explicitly mention race or gender or some of these other axes of inequality, um, because what we're doing is simply just adding to existing inequalities. And I think that's one key piece that folks often miss when we're talking about racial inequality broadly um, and an issue that critical race theory really brings out. Um, so thank you so much for, you know, for highlighting that. And then I also thought what was so important throughout the book, um, the book is very spicy because it doesn't let anybody off the hook. <laughs> so just as you mentioned how critical race theory um, very much an analysis of both the left and the right. Uh, mm -hmm. And throughout the book as well, you know, again, kind of bringing that to the forefront where critical race theory itself is not letting anybody off the hook. And I really appreciate that because I think for readers who are, who maybe have just been listening to the news for, <laughs> for understanding what critical race theory is, they're also getting a very biased understanding of what the concept is or, or what it could do. I, I agree with that. And so uh, I write about this, I think, in the introduction. One of the things that actually really appealed to me about critical race theory when I was first introduced to it was precisely that critique of not just the colorblindness on the right, but how the left had adopted aspects of colorblindness too um, and created the kinds of diversity policies that we see that are, are largely ineffective, right? And so they give sort of the illusion of an inclusive environment without uh, material resources behind that inclusion that could lead to greater equality um, and expecting a kind of uh, assimilation project that uh, is, is really the opposite of quality, right? Because assimilation uh, often assumes that the assimilating group 
uh, needs to adopt the practices and cultural uh, mores of the dominant group. So I really, I really liked that part of critical race theory because it felt, um, felt like a deeper critique uh, of, and, and, and it, it sort of eschewed easy solutions to racial inequality. Mm -hmm. Yes, it very much complicates it. And so I think one, one great thing about this book is, you know, critical race theory and really the, the, the framework that it provides for understanding society. Um, there are so many different components and it is very complex, but you're able to really break it down in ways that are easy to understand, even, you know, for example, this conversation that we're having right now around colorblind racism, which might be a concept that people have heard, but still are a little unclear of like, okay, what is that, you know, what does that really mean? And what does it have to do with me? Um, but you've really been able to kind of distill that down. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the tenets of critical race theory as well. So colorblind racism kind of being part of that, uh, but some of the other tenets that you cover in the book. Yeah, sure. So trying to think of the order of chapters here. So I'll talk about one is social construction of race. And I think that that's very important uh, to critical race theory in that uh, you hear this thrown about quite a bit. People will say, well, race is socially constructed. And some folks take that to mean we can ignore it. It doesn't matter, right? And I think what critical race theorists are saying is yes, race is socially constructed. And one of the ways in which it is constructed is through resources, differential distribution of resources and uh, providing some folks with more resources, some with less, some folks with more opportunities and some with less. And so you'll hear folks say we can ignore race. Uh, and again, I, I think that critical race theorists would say if you ignore race in that sort of colorblind way, you will be helping to perpetuate the racial inequalities that already exist. Uh, the other thing that I think is important about the idea of social construction is a lot of the sort of prominent critics of critical race theory say that critical race theory is essentialist. And it, it what they mean by that is it pits racial groups against each other. Uh, but the idea of social construction undermines the, the belief that there are natural racial groups at all. Uh, and it's a very anti-essentialist concept, right? Uh, I think the idea of structural racism is very important. And again, structural racism um, is often used for people to say, well, I'm not responsible, it's structural. Uh, and I try to frame structural racism as something that people create together collectively. Uh, I, I talk a lot, the idea of racial progress is very important to critical race theory. So there's sort of mythological notion of racial progress in the United States, that things are always getting better. But if you look sort of over time, uh, that's, that's one way to look at things, right? This mm -hmm. myth that, you know, early on there was slavery, we ended that, then there was Jim Crow, we ended that, Dr. King marched, Obama was elected, things are good now. Another way to look at it is through the lens of each of those really important moments were met with racial backlashes that uh, harmed a lot of people and actually lasted for much longer periods of time than the sort of fundamental changes that happened around Reconstruction and the Civil Rights Movement. Mm -hmm. um, so those are some of the tenants. There, there's more, uh, but I, I'll stop there for now. Yes, yes. This is a great place to stop because I actually want to talk a lot more about your chapter on racial progress because I had a lot of questions. But before we get into that, let's take a quick break. You're listening to Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. I'm Sana and I'm here with Dr. Victor Ray, Associate Professor at the University of Iowa and author of On Critical Race Theory, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care. So before the break, um, you were just kind of giving us a little bit of overview about one of the chapters in the book, which is about racial progress. 
and kind of just, you know, hitting us with the headline that, hey, yes, we have made some progress, but not as much as maybe people think because of the way that we've seen backlash against any gains that have been made. And so I think part of the um, argument that you make here in this chapter is, of course, giving some examples of time periods um, when we've seen some progress, but also what that backlash has looked like. And even contemporarily, we can definitely, I think, say that we're in a, a, a heightened period of backlash. Um, and we've seen this. I think you talk about this in the book as well, thinking about all these different um laws about voting that are very much constricting folks ability um, to vote. So just kind of that one example. Um, but I'm also thinking about how or where does this idea of racial progress, um, where does it come from? Why do we hold on to it so much? Um, and well, I'll just stop there because I have more questions, but I'll just stop there. So how is this idea of racial progress? Like, what is it doing in our society? Why are we, you know, holding on to it so tightly? And I think maybe even ignoring some of the ways that we are seeing, you know, that progress, whatever it may be, being eroded. So I, I really love this set of questions. So I'm going to start with the voting rights question because it, it takes me back to something, because it takes me back a little bit to the idea of colorblind racism. So one of the things that's important about the attack on voting rights that's happening nationally right now, mm -hmm. uh, on Black voting rights specifically, Black and Latino voting rights, uh, is that people are saying, well, it's a voter ID law, right? right. Or it's it's not it's a racially neutral law about voter ID, or it's a law about where we're going to place polling places that doesn't take into account anyone's racial background, right? Well, what they leave out is because of the history of structural racism, uh, people of color are more likely to have certain kinds of ID or no ID relative, and white folks are likely to have a different set of IDs, or depending on where you place voting places, you make it harder or easier for people to vote because our society is so segregated. And I think it's hard to see for maybe, maybe intentionally hard or people choose to not see how those are racially motivated. But I just want to point out that some voting laws under Jim Crow that we consider absolutely racist that now were also facially neutral, right? They were also colorblind laws. So when you hear about poll taxes, well, everyone was supposed to pay the poll tax, right? But poor Black sharecroppers obviously could not afford the poll tax, and it was a facially neutral way to disenfranchise people. Or when you hear about literacy tests, uh, literacy tests. Everyone was supposedly subject to literacy tests, but uh, Black folks' tests were thrown out or, you know, graded at a higher standard, right? And so I think a lot of times it's hard to see uh, racial structures in the society you live in because you're immersed. It's easier to see them in the past, and I think it's important to draw attention to how the continuity between those things. So what I think the idea of progress is doing is, first of all, I want to say that um, I'm going to borrow from Ibram Kendi here. And I think he has this phrase of like, yes, racial progress has happened, right? Like, I would never want to say that what the civil rights movement accomplished was not brave and momentous and, and really incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, but Kendi has this phrase, but racist progress also happened, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, that racists have... Um, some folks have never stopped opposing the civil rights movement. Some folks who never stopped opposing the civil rights movement are now on the Supreme Court and created the, uh, you know, cut the heart out of the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about progress, it's important to think about the reaction, but it's also important to think about like how no victory is ever final, mm -hmm. right? So we often you know, in the US, people want to be like, we solved this problem, we can move on to the next one. And I think that that came through very clearly in this last session of the Supreme Court, specifically with the overturning of Roe, something that people that the justices who overturned Roe said was settled law, you don't need to worry about this, right. Um, so 
when we think about progress, especially I and you know I'm writing about racial progress, I think, and I'll, I'll, this is the last thing I'll say is that the idea of progress often also gets used as a kind of cudgel to tell people to stop asking for their rights, right? Mm -hmm. And so I hear, I think about, you know, Colin Kaepernick and folks saying, what are you complaining about? Get up, stop kneeling, get up. Uh, and like he was responding to a well-documented empirical reality of disproportionate police violence, right? And like, it's an empirical question of whether that violence is more or less than in the past, but nonetheless, it is still elevated and protesting against it is supposedly a protected right. And so I think this, so I think this idea of progress needs to be interrogated when folks, when it's used to say, what are you still complaining about? Why are you still protesting? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's such an important point about how progress is weaponized against folks um, and that we should just be happy with whatever it is that we currently have. Um, now, as we're thinking about, you know, continuing progress or even securing or making secure the rights that we already have, you know, it brings up this question and you touch on this in um, the, the next chapter, which talks about interest convergence. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more for our listeners, you know, what interest convergence is and how this could be a potential stumbling block or maybe opportunity as we're thinking about uh, moving towards racial equality. Sure, this is another great question. So interest convergence is an idea, a very controversial idea from critical race theory and specifically Derek Bell, who argued that progress for Black Americans specifically has mostly occurred in U.S. history when there was equal or greater benefits to white Americans. And he uses the case of um, both the Civil War, but also the case of Brown v. Board of Education to, to make his point. And he says that Yes, there were always white Americans who supported integrated, integra integrated schooling. They were a minority. The, the really, the elite Americans who were able to get Brown through didn't come on board until uh, this Cold War made them, right? Mm -hmm. And so there were, the communist governments were very successfully using racism in America to recruit proxy states and the State Department and the government recognized that this was dangerous to America's uh, national interests. And so they supported Brown v. Board, right? And so hopefully out of this, right, is when you're thinking about creating policy or social movement tactics or strategy, try and make interests converge. <laughs> try and figure out where your group's interests or your your yeah your group's interests align with are able to form coalitions with other groups um, in ways that are mutually beneficial and can create progress this sort of more pessimistic view of this and one that i think derek bell holds is that you know in the, in that chapter i believe i talk about what bell calls the permanence of racism Mm -hmm. And that these moments of convergence in U.S. history have been sometimes rare. And that when those moments pass, you get the kind of backlash that we were talking about earlier. So I wrote a different piece for, for uh, Democracy Journal a, a few weeks ago, it was published, that talks about, that tries to situate the current moral panic in the anti-authoritarian movements around the world. So whereas Bell was saying this convergence happened because of the Cold War, I'm mm -hmm. saying, well, there's no longer a Cold War. There's now rising authoritarianism. And that actually makes it easier for the anti-critical race theory folks in the United States and to see the kinds of cases that we're seeing in the Supreme Court, right? The Supreme Court, the sort of like international check mm -hmm. on US authoritarianism has fallen away and so we have rising authoritarianism. Mm 
Mm, yes. You know, I'm thinking too, as you explain this, of course, you know, it makes sense, right? We would want to expand kind of our coalitions, kind of incorporate more folks, power in numbers, right? Um, but also there are some intense barriers to kind of having multiracial coalitions as well, which you talk about also um, in this idea of whiteness as property, which I think for some folks might seem very strange, right? Like, what do you mean whiteness is property or that it maybe confers some sort of rights? Um, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it means that um, whiteness has some sort of benefits or access to resources um, as we think through critical race theory and how it, how it can be a tool for us to understand racial inequality. Sure, so in that chapter, I'm responding to Cheryl Harris's classic article called Whiteness as Property. Mm -hmm. um, and in that article and in the chapter, uh, Harris opens with a discussion of her grandmother who was a, a uh, sharecropper from the South who was light skinned enough to pass as white, uh, but considered black in the South. And she moved to Chicago. So she moves to Chicago, she moves to a black neighborhood in Chicago, and she goes out and tries to get a job and cannot because she thought she was escaping, you know, some aspects of racism by leaving the South. And she finds out that Chicago uh, also segregates schools and jobs and neighborhoods. So she decides that she's going to pass as white in order to get access to jobs. And she does. Uh, and it creates some bitterness uh, in her. Uh, one, denying her identity. And two, hearing the kind of casual racism that happened in the all-white space. So Harris takes this notion of her grandmother getting access to the literal property provided by a job um, mm -hmm. and, you know, uses it as not just a metaphor, but an actual description of how property rights have worked in U.S. history, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a whole host of ways that access to jobs, access to loans, access to education, access to... Um, schooling, access of the right to marry in certain instances, right, mm -hmm. that are our property relations, even if we don't like to think of them as property relations, that were denied to Black Americans and Native Americans very, very explicitly, right? And I think we can see some of those things still playing out. So you all often see these news reports of, you know, uh, appraising Black how appraising houses if they think the appraiser believes the homeowner is black versus the homeowner is white and if it, they you know look at the same house and they believe it's a white homeowner all of a sudden the house is worth two hundred thousand dollars more right mm -hmm. um or we can think about the devaluation of housing in black neighborhoods which is an ongoing problem you can think about the history of loan denial discrimination in work uh to say that whiteness itself is is a form of property that allows folks to allows folks access to other forms of property. Mm -hmm. Yes, and you know I think what's so compelling about this chapter because I think for some people reading this they might think, okay, wait a minute. First you're telling me race is socially constructed. Now you're telling me that it's giving me some sort of property rights or some sort of access to resources, which seems very real to me, right? Um, you either get the home loan or you don't. Uh, but I think what, and, and again, I think the strength of this book is just like in our conversation, how throughout the book, you have these very contemporary examples, right? Um, as you mentioned, it, it seems like there's always a new headline talking about how whatever huge corporation like a Wells Fargo or some other has denied folks or granted access differentially to Black Americans in particular, right? So to your point earlier, Whereas we might be able to say, oh, this type of racist policy or practice definitely existed in some far away time period, right? Before we were born. There's also these examples today that 
have us, you know, bring us back to this moment to say that, no, this is still happening now. And what are we going to do about it? Which I think is really the whole premise of the book is saying like, what are we going to do about it? Here's some ways we can really examine society. Now let's do something with this information. Yeah, I think uh, one of the reasons that I think folks are attacking critical race theory so vehemently is that critical race theory arose to explain the prior backlash. Mm -hmm. And they know that it would be effective explaining the current backlash, right? And so, uh, you know, you try and discredit your, not your your weakest opponent, but your best opponent, mm -hmm. right? And uh, in response to the murders of George Floyd, I think a bunch of folks went to anti-racist literature, some of it critical race theory, some of it not. Um, that, as, as you're saying, explains the current situation, right? And they there's some folks who don't want this situation clearly explained. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's take another break. This is Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. You're listening to Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. I'm Sana, and I'm chatting with Dr. Victor Ray. He's an associate professor at the University of Iowa and the author of On Critical Race Theory, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care. Now, I have to talk about chapter nine of the book. It's about intersectionality. And I feel like I can never pass up an opportunity to talk about intersectionality because much like critical race theory, intersectionality is or has become a buzzword that a lot of people use in a lot of different ways, <laughs> but maybe don't have a clear understanding of its meaning or very much its origins. And again, what it was meant to do. So could you tell us, you know, what is intersectionality um, and what was it created to do? Mm, that's a hard question. So uh, intersectionality is part of critical race theory. Uh, and I'll, I'll start with Crenshaw, right? So Kimberly Crenshaw is credited with coining the term intersectionality in order to explain sort of the specific kinds of inequality that the legal that women of color faced that are often not recognized by the legal system right so in the book i talk about a classic article that she wrote in which um some women were suing black women were suing gm because g general motors because general motors let them go uh, during a recession. And General Motors' explanation for letting them go during a recession was that they lacked seniority, right? Mm -hmm. During Before this economic downturn, they lacked seniority. Union rules meant they were first to go. So these women sued saying that they, they were being let go because of discrimination based not on their gender, because prior to, you know, uh, I think it was, I don't remember the year, but prior to a specific year, uh, GM hired black men. And it wasn't because of their gender, because also prior to that year, they hired white women, but prior to a given year, they had never hired black women. So it was literally only folks at the intersection of these two structural identities who were fired. And the court, uh, refused to recognize their claim, saying we don't want to create a new class of person, <laughs> basically, mm -hmm. although that class existed. It was the, <laughs> the, the class of person that was bringing the claim, right? And so Crenshaw was trying to develop a concept that recognized that people at the intersection of various legally recognized categories could nonetheless sort of fall through the cracks of the law and have no legal protections. But although Crenshaw is credited with the term, there's a long history of black feminist thought and thinkers who recognize that black women in specifically and women of color more broadly faced 
particular challenges because they lived at the intersection of multiply marginalized categories, right? So that is what, what intersectionality, uh, how it arose as a concept and sort of what it was trying to explain. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much for that because I see all the time and I'm sure uh, folks listening as well have seen folks talk about themselves as having intersectional identities and, and going down a whole list of characteristics, but not necessarily uh, structural locations, right? So not necessarily related to these uh, positions of power um, and inequality, which is what intersectionality is about. It's not simply, um, you know, kind of your preferences and your personality traits, <laughs> uh, but we are talking about power and power relations and being able to understand those power relations. Um, so thank you so much for that. I always, like I said, I cannot pass up an opportunity to kind of um, really talk about intersectionality um, and again, provide some folks some understanding about what the concept is. Um, so of course, we're talking about your book on critical race theory, why it matters and why you should care. So when folks read this book, what is it that you want them to kind of take away from it by the end of the book? So I want them to take away the fact that racial inequality is a serious problem and deserves to be treated seriously. And the sort of current debate around it um, minimizes that and tries to erase that. Uh, I also want folks, I mean, so, you know, I end the book talking about how in order to get like black and white school children sitting together in the classroom, like we had to call in the National Guard, mm -hmm. right? The seriousness of racial inequality and racism in the United States, uh, has has you know it led to a war that killed more Americans than any other, right? Like it is a very serious, very long-standing problem. Um, and I think that critical race that one of the reasons that folks should care about critical race theory is it is a serious attempt to grapple with that problem. Now, is it perfect? No, no sort of social theory is perfect but it is a serious attempt to grapple with that problem. And if we, if we hope to solve our collective problems, we need to approach a problem that has been with us literally since before the country was founded with the seriousness that it deserves. Mm, yes. I mean, I definitely walked away with that from your book. And again, I think part of the power of the book that you've written is because it is so easy to read and immediately applicable, right? You can read the book and you can automatically see the examples that you've given in the book. You can see them in your everyday life. And so you really made it real, this part of like why people should care, but also why it matters that we understand, you know, critical race theory and we don't just fall into kind of what maybe talking heads are telling us um, about what critical race theory is and why we should be afraid of it, right? Um, and so I really, really enjoyed reading your book. And I would love to ask you just a couple questions about the writing process as well. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> because I also know, um, and you kind of talk about this, that the book was kind of like a quick writing exercise for you, right? We oh. kind of think about years and years that people kind of take in developing ideas and writing a book, which of course you've been working with these ideas for years and years, uh, but you hadn't already been writing this book. So could you talk a little bit about your writing process and getting something, um, writing something fairly quickly and also thinking about the audience that you were you know targeting as well sure so i'll say a couple of things about the writing process one is i i wrote the book in in about three months uh, <laughs> and but the only reason that that was possible is i've been teaching courses on critical race theory for many years Mm -hmm. And I drew heavily on my lecture notes and reading notes that I have been uh, 
using and talking about, you know, and and writing about for many years. So there, there's probably not another topic I could have done it that quickly on. Um, and uh, I guess in terms of the process, you know, you hear a lot, I, I think, like, write every day. So I think in this case, I didn't have much choice but to write every day. Um, and yeah, I wrote every day. And this was a public book. So it didn't go through sort of a formal peer review. But I did have a great editor at Penguin, uh, who, Jamia Wilson, who um, gave me feedback. And uh, as an academic, I did also circulate many chapters to some folks I uh, shouted out in the acknowledgments who gave me feedback um, and just, you know, kept me from going too astray. So I, I had sort of, you know, I would complete a chapter, send it out, and then start writing the next one like that same day if, if necessary. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, because, you know, I'm finishing up a book right now. And, you know, I hear three months and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I would just collapse. Um, but as you mentioned, you have been, you know, working through these ideas. And I think the great piece is, you know, teaching these ideas, which means you've gotten a lot of immediate feedback from students where they're like, wait, I don't understand what you're saying <laughs> at all. Yeah. Um, so I would say that too, like one of my goals with this book was like, I wanted, you know, my audience was like smart undergrads, right? Mm -hmm. Like I was trying to like, okay, my undergrads, if I assigned them this book, will they be able to get it? Because that's sort of like the level I wanted it pitched at. The other is like the feedback, like I was teaching a critical race theory class during the semester that I was writing the book. And like, I would just go in and be like, what do y'all think about this? <laughs> so that was also very useful. The other thing I'll say is like, my partner was incredibly helpful um, and generous in that, like there were a couple of weekends in which I just like went in a hotel room and wrote the entire weekend. Like I just, you know, a few blocks from the house and just wrote, yeah, nonstop for two or three days. So it's another yeah. way, to, not the best sort of writing <laughs> strategy, but you know, I, I was pressed for time. So. <laughs> right, but yes to all the support in your life, right? So having yes. supportive colleagues, having a supportive partner, um, having a captive audience in your students to yeah. also bounce ideas off of. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And then I would say that the last thing was like, I've written you know a number of public pieces and we academics, um, spend years on a project, but when you when you write public pieces and you know an editor contacts you and is like you have two days, mm -hmm. um, it it helps you develop the ability to just like finish something and let it go. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Now, one thing that I really um, thinking about the differences between kind of like academic writing and more public writing. Um, one thing that you do right away in your book is that you put yourself in the book, right? You share some mm -hmm. personal experiences, um, some family experiences um, about experiencing racism as a child. And, you know, as academics, we're often trained to not put ourselves in our writing and to quote unquote, be objective. Yet all of us are in our research in some way, whether we, you know, acknowledge it or not, because we are writing it from our brain, right? From our brains, from our, you know, point of view. Um, and so I'm wondering for you, how was that to be able to really acknowledge like, this is where I'm writing from and kind of these are my personal experiences with racism. And this is also me, you know, in this writing as well. So I, I really like this question too. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the story I relate. I, I'm light skinned mixed race person. Uh, my father is black, my mother is white, and the, I, I opened the book with the first time the police were caught on my family when I was two at a parade with my uncle, uh, mm -hmm. and people thought he had abducted me rather than, you know, being a caregiver, um, and then I, I relate sort of that's happened to me a bunch of times in my life in which the police have stopped uh, my family 
um, or you know my brothers um, and let me let me go. Um, and I felt comfortable doing that for a number of reasons, but the biggest one, like my family gave me permission, right? <laughs> right? But um, the, the biggest reason is that critical race theory uh, thinks that stories and narratives are really important for one, sharing stories across the kind of racial barriers and boundaries that we've built up, but two, as a corrective to the overwhelmingly uh, white stories that are in the media and in the press and in, you know, the history of scholarship, even race scholarship. Uh, so I felt like writing a book about critical race theory, um, I'm not in there a, a whole lot because I, I still, you know, have my sort of sociological roots, but uh, I felt like writing a book about critical race theory, I had to be in there some uh, mm -hmm. because personal narrative is such a big part, right? And I would say that, um, you know, you are absolutely right that a lot of folks would say, oh, if you put yourself in the book, you're not objective. And I would say, if that is the case, the long history of ex racial exclusion uh, of the stories of people of color means that the sort of white canon is also not objective, right? And, yeah. and uh, stories like mine can provide a, perhaps a very small corrective to that lack of objectivity. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. All right. I know we're getting close to the end of our time together this morning, but I have one final question for you. You know, after writing a book, you know, on critical race theory and also sharing so many different examples of contemporary racial inequality, um, what is giving you hope these days? Where, where is your hope coming from? And, and maybe where is the, the hope going? Uh, so what is giving me hope these days? So, um, critical race theory gives me some hope. So I think there's a thing that Derek Bell says that is like, he's like, look, racism is probably a permanent feature of the United States. Nonetheless, like struggling against or fighting against this kind of inequality is fulfilling in and of itself, right? And that might not necessarily be hopeful, but I think it does give you some perspective on like, like where I'm coming from. Um, but I think like to the extent that like progress is possible, I think it's like grounded in social movements that are aimed at sort of making the world a better place. And so those, those are the kinds of things that give me hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that, Victor. And thanks so much for hanging out with us this morning and giving us a little bit about your book on critical race theory, why it matters and why you should care. Thank you, Victor. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Thank you again to Dr. Victor Ray, Associate Professor at the University of Iowa and author of On Critical Race Theory, Why It Matters and Why You Should Care. This was an absolute joy to read, even though it's a very difficult topic, or at least it's dealing with a lot of difficult topics, I should say. Um, but the way Victor is able to break down this concept and really explain the different components of critical race theory and also bring in these everyday examples, it just makes it so easy to understand. Um, and I think it gives a, a great uh, framework for also understanding these different debates that are happening about critical race theory as well. Um, so congratulations to Victor for being able to write this book and then get it done in such a short time period. I know this book is going to do a lot of great work out there in the world. Uh, for today's positive note, I want to leave you with a quote by James Baldwin that says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I thought this quote was just 
so on target for today's conversation, for also thinking about racial inequality that continues to exist, and also how critical race theory and a book like On Critical Race Theory can help us understand what's happening and also, most importantly, what we can do. Well, this has been Let's Grab Coffee on WYXR 91.7 FM. I'm Sana. I'm here every Monday morning chatting with some really smart folks who are doing important work and helping us understand the world around us. If you missed any part of today's conversation, don't worry. You can always catch the replay on WYXR.org or go ahead and subscribe to Let's Grab Coffee in podcast format available wherever you stream podcasts. That way you will never miss a conversation. I cannot wait to be back here with you next Monday.